Welcome back to the bench. Over the years, I've accumulated or built several little interesting electronic toys, or I should say tools, for helping me do diagnostics, moving floppy disks, doing file transfers, and things of the like. So I figured I would show you some of those cool tools today. Let's check it out. The first thing I have here is a prototype of a floppy disk cleaner. Not a disk head cleaner, a disk cleaner. So uh, I was kind of commissioned by a friend to build a unit here um, with an Arduino and with, a, with a, um, a floppy drive here that will clean floppy disks. Um, you know, you can, you can get these uh, five and a quarter floppy disks that have like mold and gunk on them. And he wanted a way to be able to automatically clean a huge stack of them. Say he got a whole bunch from an estate sale, wanted to preserve them, but also wanted to clean those disks up. And instead of using a swab and wiping it and turning the, the disk and wiping it and turning the disk, he's like, there's got to be some way to automate that. And he's like, Joe, do you have an idea? And I'm like, yeah. So here's the premise of the system. So we have an Arduino uh, controller that is connected to the floppy drive uh, and just on the control pins. And this works very similar to those, those floppy music systems where you can get an Arduino, hook it up to a floppy drive and make the motor move to make music. Very similar uh, situation, except this is programmed with a, a static routine. And basically you put your floppy disk in here, close the lid, and then you hit the button here and it will run the, the head It'll, it'll spin the disc, then run the head in and out. Um, this is, of course, just a prototype. This is a prototype 3D platen here that holds all the bits together and it's all secured. Um, uh, in reality, you would use a probably a dead floppy drive one with bad heads. And you go in here and replace the heads with um, some soft felt that is safe for the floppy surface, super soft felt. And you would hook up up here some sort of... Um, uh, automatic uh, uh, alcohol distribution system that distri distributes, in, distributes into the pad. You squeeze it and it does the thing. But I didn't develop that part. I only developed the, the software slash hardware solution here. So um, yeah, let's let's just show you it working. So basically you've got the Arduino connected here, goes to here. This is an interrupt pin. So then when you press it, it runs the cycle. It's got a couple power pins here coming off this ATX or this AT power supply. It's grounded together. Um, and then the floppy drive is plugged in. So we turn on the big master clicky switch. You see it just goes eh. And when I press this button, it'll run a cycle. See it? And you can't see it spinning the disc because the drive's not closed, but it does the cycle in and out, and that's it. That's basically the entire solution. It's pretty super straightforward. So let's take a look at uh, the next toy here. So this is the next toy I have. This is a 4164 and 41256 DRAM tester. Um, now this is, I didn't design this. This comes from an online kit, link in the description, um, with a pre-built code and a pre-built schematic and everything. All you gotta do is get some perf board, um, some basic components, throw the code on an Arduino uh, Uno, wire it up, and that's it. It does the magic. It will test, uh, 4164 uh, and 41256 ROMs. You just put the right one in. You change this, uh, change the jumper based on what the ROM is and hit the reset button over here, which causes it to run through a cycle. And it'll show green blinking while it's running the test. It'll show green solid when the test is complete and red if the RAM is bad. In addition to that, if you plug it in here to your computer and actually watch the the serial console in the Arduino IDE, or however you want to watch the serial console on that, it'll actually show you where in the RAM that failed. Um, I used it recently to test some RAMs that I thought were bad. Most were bad, but I did find one in the set that I thought was bad that was good. So this has been super helpful to me. Next little piece of magic is this mess right here. This is called an XC1541. It is basically, um, oops, I got two things in there, XC1451. This basically allows you to connect this end to your parallel port on your computer or on your, your DOS PC, really. Connect this end right here into your Commodore 64 and move disk images. Um, early, not the Commodore 64, but the... Um, 
the, uh, the 1541 disk drive itself and allow you to move disk images back and forth from the drive to the PC and from the PC to the drive. Again, there's schematics for this online, link in the description. I've used this a couple times um, where I was uh, testing things and I wasn't quite uh, quite trusting the circumstances of what was coming out of my Easy Flash 3 cartridge. Uh, so I put that together to test it, and this actually helped me confirm uh, some issues that I had. Um, so super helpful there. Next up is this silly little thing. This is an Amiga, Amiga Floppy Parallel Cable. Uh, again, really silly. So what this is is just a standard uh, floppy cable right here that will connect to any old floppy drive you want it to, um, standard floppy drive. And then this end goes into the back of, again, your Windows PC. It's, it, this works under Windows. And it uses very, very uh, tight timing. You, yeah, you actually have to turn off multi-threading on your computer and put, boot it into you know a special kernel test mode and disable all of the other um, cores on the machine and whatnot. But anyway, um, you boot it into that special mode, run the software, and this will actually write Amiga floppy images to Amiga floppy disks uh, if you don't have another solution. Or, you know, you're, you've downloaded something off the internet, you're just trying to bootstrap and get something up running. This is super helpful for that. I have used this and tested it, and it does work. It's kind of magical. Uh, next little thing that I have that is very helpful is a SCSI 2 SD for my Macs, but in this case it's in a 3D printed case. So this is the SCSI 2 SD that has the the actual 25 pin connector on it. You can buy these online just about anywhere. Um, and then I, this was before I actually had a 3D printer. I bought it with a pre-made uh, 3D uh, printed uh, case. But um, this is kind of my portable hard drive. This is my SCSI based floppy EMU, if you want to call it that. And I use this when I'm trying to do diagnostics. I need to do quick tr file transfers, all different types of things like that on my old classic Macs that have the 25 pin uh, SCSI, uh, SCSI connector on it. It's super, super helpful for those kinds of things. Um, especially, you know, if you're getting a Mac in and you need to test it um, and say the client hasn't sent you the hard drive or anything with it, you're just trying to do a boot test or, you know, you're testing it after, uh, after you've done a repair or something, you don't have the boot media, you just plug this into the back, boot it right up. Uh, I have uh, OS 608 on this, which is compatible with most of the older classic Macs that are going to have that connector on it, but it's easy enough to actually just uh, just uh, remove the flash card out of there, put a different one that, say, has 753 on it that's compatible with newer Macs. The next little uh, toy right here, and as you can see, a lot of these are floppy toys because that's one of the biggest things you got to deal with with these old uh, older computers is getting media to boot. This is what is called a um, flux engine. Basically, it's a little Cypress uh, semiconductor kit board that's had a 34-pin uh, header uh, uh, solder to it and some software uploaded to it. And so you connect this end to the USB port on your PC and run a little uh, run a little pro, uh, client program and you connect the other end of this to a classic floppy drive like this one or even a three and a three and a half inch drive whichever one you want and you can both dump and write certain kinds of floppy images to those drives it's kind of a it's kind of like a cryoflux or you know a, a grease weasel or something like that but um, it is a lot more affordable this little uh, development board is something like 20 or 30 dollars all of the software is free and open source. You grab this, follow the instructions, wire this thing up. The hardest thing to do with this is actually just wiring the connector. You just need to have some header pins wired across and then connect one of the, the ground pins over here. And then you've got a way to image old DOS, uh, DOS floppies, for example. You know, if you, you're, you're running an old, um, or you're running a brand new Windows 10 machine, um, you know, it, it's almost impossible to get these floppies to work on those machines because they don't have a floppy port. Well, this basically gives you a floppy port um, for the specific purpose of uh, writing and dumping images for the really old computers uh, if you do not have media for them. Now, the final little toy is something that I have designed myself, and I've talked about it before, but I wanted to talk about it again. And that is all of this magic right here, because it's still in development. I wanted to talk about it just a little bit. Um, this is my uh, Apple II uh, E and Apple III 
keyboard, uh, keyboard encoder replacement. It replaces the keyboard encoder for the KR9600 and the AY, uh, AY5-3600 encoder chips that are in the Apple IIe's, the Apple IIe's, the Apple IIc Plus, and some some Apple II Pluses have a version of this uh, a version of this chip on the on the interface board on the back of the keyboard itself. Some don't, so I don't say that it's fully compatible with the Apple II Plus. Um, and so you know, I just kind of prototyped this thing together, um, and I used the keyboard for the most part. I used the keyboard code that came from my JCM1 keyboard and modified it just a little bit. It didn't really require a lot of work. Um, modified it to work uh, with the timing and requirements of the AY5-3600 chip and put it on a breadboard and it worked. It worked pretty much the first time. I had a couple uh, software iterations I had to work through. Um, and yeah, so here is the, so this is the first prototype, you know, the actual prototype I built. Uh, and then this, I believe here, yep, this is number zero. This is the second I would call it the second prototype. I had a couple little minor changes I had to make to the wiring, nothing huge there. Um, and uh, this this one actually with the chip will work perfectly fine. I just I don't I don't um, I don't uh, I don't send these out to people, not the prototype version anyway, unless somebody really really wants. Joe, I want one of your prototypes. Um, and then here is the final uh, or the final version of version one. Uh, goes in the computer like this. Um, and this is a PIC 16F 18875, which uh, the reason I chose this is because it has enough uh, I.O. pins to do everything that's required. And the board underneath just translates across and it does the thing. It's super straightforward. I am developing a second version of this, as you can see with this little weird contraption I've built here. So this is, you know, one of the regular, this is one of the regular boards right here with a wire harness that I've had to wire up to the pins up on a, a QFP version of this chip so that I can make a small version, a super, super tiny version that will fit in most computers. This, this is almost done. As you can see, I got a couple bodges because I have to re-spin these boards. They're not quite correct. Um, you know, here's the bare board itself. I have to spin a couple versions of this. Uh, I might even spin it and do um, smaller resistors here. But basically, uh, once this is done, if I ever get around to finishing it, this won't just replace the ones for the Apple II and the Apple III. Uh, I can put the default keyboard mapping on this or the default uh, key matrix mapping on this and anything out there that uses one of these chips, this would be compatible for. Say, I don't know, an arcade machine that might use it for some reason, I don't know. Um, I'm not sure what all applications are out there. The Apple II is the only thing I know of that actually uses this chip um, or the Apple II and the Apple III. But um, if there's a, you know, if that's ever out there and I get this done, this will be a universal replacement. Of course, I'm using a higher, I'm using higher pins here, but uh, in the final version, I will use even shorter pins for this. So it'll basically be, be the same height, you know, it'd be the same height as a, as a regular chip. Right now it's a little tall, um, but I want to try to get it sh shrunk down so it's more like, more like that height. So it'll clear uh, machines with low clearance. Uh, for example, the Apple IIc. So yeah, um, if you want one of these, you can go to my website, jcm-1.com and pick one up. I still have some, as you can see right like there, uh, I still have some for sale. So if you've got an Apple II, uh, Apple IIe or Apple III with a bad keyboard controller, which are actually more likely to happen in the Apple III, um, yeah, go to my website, grab one, and we can do that for you. So you're probably wondering why I took this time to show you a whole bunch of cobbled together electronic tools. Well, I really wanted to share those with you, truly. I put together a lot of little kits and things to help me while I'm diagnosing, playing with, fixing, or doing whatever with my old computers. And a lot of these things that I've shown you have been really helpful to me in the past. I just wanted to take the opportunity to share those with you to let you know that no matter what, there is always a way to do something with these old computers that you might think is impossible. So you gotta learn to think outside the box hunt around and ask people for their ideas and thoughts on ways to do stuff. That's what I've done. I've been able to make all these cool things to let me to keep playing with this hobby. In addition, I have two, three, 
maybe even four projects going on right now that I'm wrist deep in um, that are taking a lot of extra time in my focus right now. And I wanted to try to stick to a schedule and get something out there for you guys. So I put together this quick video for you so that you would have something to watch in the interim. Now here's the important part. A couple of those projects are related to this guy right back here, Marchintosh. What is Marchintosh? And you may, be, uh, may have seen me hinting about this. Marchintosh is the March-long classic Mac uh, celebration extravaganza across social media and uh, internet media of all kinds. Um, Ron's uh, computer videos, myself, Steve, uh, uh, Steve of Mac 84, Computer Clan, and a bunch of the people on the Mac Yak uh, podcast are going to be participating in Marchintosh. And what we're going to do is the entire month of March, we are going to be playing with, fixing, repairing, uh, telling stories about, history about classic Macs from the original 1984 Mac up into about Mac OS 9. Now here's the cool part about Marchintosh. It is not a closed group. You can participate too if you want. All you got to do is make your favorite thing about your favorite classic Mac, put it on whatever media you have access to, whether it's YouTube or Instagram, Facebook, Twitch, whatever, tag it with Marchintosh and upload it. And that's all there is to it. If you want more details of how to participate in Marchintosh, go to Marchintosh.com. All of the details are right up there. Well, thank you for hanging out for me today. Remember to like, subscribe, and ring the bell to stay up to date on my latest adventures. You can also support me through Patreon or by snagging some merch at jcm-1.com. Links in the description. Well, that's all for today's episode. While you're here, check out some of my videos. And remember, Marchintosh is just around the corner.